Hello, everybody. Welcome to the CCA BFA conversations uh, for the fall 2020 semester. Uh, today, we're going to be honoring uh, some students from both the individualized program, the jewelry metal arts program, and the ceramics program. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Erin uh, Winarto. Uh, they use they, them pronouns, uh, and Ben Chung, who uses he, him pronouns, Eugen Han, who uses she, her pronouns. And these three amazing students will talk briefly about their work, about 10 minutes. And we also have uh, Amy Tavern here, uh, who is going to have a conversation with each, each of our students after they present. Um, our faculty will be introducing each of the students. And today I'm going to begin by uh, reciting a land acknowledgement. And if you're not familiar with a land acknowledgement, it's a way to honor the original stewards of the land and the places where we reside. So I'm going to begin there. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge that we are all present in the places where we reside because of colonization and genocide of the indigenous people. I want to honor the Ramatush Ohlone people who are the original inhabitants of Yalamu, also known as San Francisco, where we're broad broadcasting from here at CCA. I want to recognize the Ohlone, Chechenyo, and Karkin people in the places where I've lived in the Bay Area. I want us to consider our connection to the land, that the land is not to be thought of as a resource, but the source of everything. We are the land, the land is us. We do not exist without it. And I vow to respect and honor the land and its original stewards who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. Our community opposes all forms of individualized and institutionalized racism towards all people, including indigenous people in which discrimination has occurred through the omission and silencing of their voices. I want to encourage us all to discover, respect, and honor the amazing indigenous people and cultures from the lands where you reside and the areas your ancestors occupied. One way you can learn a little bit more about um, the Native Lands is a website. It's www.native-lands.ca. It's not a complete international um, uh, resource, but it does have some of the names of the original indigenous lands and the names of the people where they're from. So it's a great resource for everybody. Um, today, we are joined by Amy Tavern, and I'm going to read a brief bio of hers. Um, Amy, it's so nice to see you. Uh, Amy Tavern is an interdisciplinary artist, uh, metalsmith, and instructor whose work focuses on personal memory, emotional response, and place. Amy, Amy holds a BA, BA in Arts Administration from the State University of New York College in Fredonia a BFA in metal design from the University of Washington, and an MFA in fine arts from California College of the Arts. Um, I first was introduced to Amy when she, um, uh, maybe even at the SNAG conference, but she was the, an amazing uh, uh, artist in resident for us here in the metal arts program several years ago. And it um, was such a, a great privilege to have her work with our students and get to know her. Um, She's exhibited widely with solo exhibitions in the US, Belgium, and Sweden, and she has taught and lectured across the US and in Europe. And her work has been featured in many publications, including Metalsmith Magazine, American Craft, and American Craft. Amy is a former Penland School of Crafts artist in residence and has completed numerous residencies in Iceland. Amy lives here and works here in San Francisco, California. Um, our first presenter is Erin, and Erin Wernarto, uh, I will read a bio of theirs. So Erin Wernarto is an interdisciplinary artist and a maker who draws inspiration from a wide variety of sources, including, but not limited to, world history, alternative youth sub subcultures, critical leftist theory, occult studies, and indigenous knowledge. They enjoy pondering life's deepest mysteries, discovering their new, hob uh, discovering their new hobby of the month, and 
the small but serendipitous moments of every life. Born to a family of immigrant Indonesian immigrants who moved to Southern California, Aaron grew up in in between seemingly disparate worlds without a clear grasp of their identity until stumbling across various creative communities, both online and in real life. Through experimenting with different mediums and their ten techniques, their work, Aaron strives to transcend the barriers imposed by language to communicate their hidden, unseen, and forgotten. I've had the privilege of working with Aaron for just one semester, and in this time, I've been able to see Aaron's ability to make connections between seemingly disparate places of inspiration to express very personal and intergenerational lived experiences. They have a complete architecture of thinking. Um, they're able to kind of pull together all these different parts of, of their interests together um, and support their work uh, um, through those many different disparate parts. Um, their work uses cuteness as a tool for engagement. And uh, when one looks deep, deeply at their work and feels more deeply at the work, the pieces, complexity and history and even trauma, as well as catharsis emerge from their work when one spends time with it. So Aaron, enjoy your ability to pull from any practices and points of inspirations and theories. And this will help you continue to develop your rich art practice and this ability will help you solve challenges in innovative ways for any of your goals. I look forward to seeing your art and your career progress. Welcome, Erin. Thank you. Oh. Is it showing? The right screen? Um, right now, the screen is blank. Here it is. Now okay, we can. Okay. Sorry, it said it was sharing the screen and then I didn't fall. Thank you for the Just introduction. Um, but thank you for the introduction, Curtis. Um, so I'm just going to get like right into it and talk a little bit about my inspirations first. Um, so. Um, I kind of consider this my Bible. It's our, our Aesthetic Categories by Cyan Ngai. Um, it's a book that talks about aesthetic theory and like thinking about like the function of aesthetics and like what their cultural and like socio-political context might be. Um, with specific regards to cuteness, um, I feel like it lends itself towards my work. Um, and um, visual artists that I'm inspired by um, include Yoshitomo Nara, whose um, range of work is all unified by a very distinct style. And I find his use of cuteness to be subversive with like the very childlike representation of more mature and like darker themes. Um, another artist that I really appreciate is Pip and Pop, um, a former duo from Australia who's now just, um, run by Tanya Schultz and I really appreciate the like eclectic variety and like use of material kind of like legitimizing um craft practices and like the haptic quality that it carries and the sort of like idea of um fantasy world building which I think uh shows up in my work a lot um then I have some a couple of like past work that I'd like to show um this series is called Infinite Mortality, which are just like um, these like little reminders of spiritual mindfulness. Um, it was kind of inspired by like stained glass murals and like sticky window art. Um, you just like pop on the window. Um, and there are digital renderings um, that I would like to print at some point. Um, and then I've I've worked across like a variety of mediums, but one medium that has really like stuck out with me was paper making. Um, and so in this um, series, I was just um, focusing on like material investigation as a part of my process and being able to preserve um, memory and time through embedding objects physically. Um, and then we're just gonna get into my senior thesis exhibition. 
Um, so this first piece is a reiteration of an older work um, that I did uh, that was like a monotype um, and drawing collage. And I wanted to recreate it um, by screen printing this on canvas. Um, uh, it depicts feelings of hopelessness and despair and like dissociation through this like video game-esque kind of metaphor and the feeling of like glitching out. Um, and the title Evil Sock um, actually alludes to this metaphor further by referencing a Kirby villain, which is a video game series for those of you not familiar. Um, this next piece I did um, is jacquard weaving, um, which is a really interesting process because it requires um, like digital processes along with analog processes. Um, uh, this piece is sort of an exploration of like a digitized existence that's made marketable and like thinking about like online identities um, kind of being like the basis of the society that we live in right now. And this specific piece is contending with cuteness and hypersexualization as a marketing tool given the ads. Um, there's like some dating site ads included. Um, and I was thinking a lot about like our parasitic relationship with the web, um, the constant like sensory and the content of overload that we experience online. And also like looking into the um, militant like internet surveillance that has been going on since the 70s, I believe um, in America, but pretty much like across the globe. Um, I was also thinking about how the jacquard weaving process um, uses pixels, which is how like they're equated with each um, pick or like each uh, strand of yarn and how these digital processes like can create actual weave structures and designs. Um, this next piece included in my show um, is titled A Song for the Serpent, which is an electro etching that I did this semester. Um, I was thinking a lot about the idealization of purity and innocence, um, which kind of um, alludes to like my upbringing um, as a Catholic. Um, and, and I was just mostly thinking about like the, the sort of like fatalistic and like dogmatic nature of Christianity, like there is a very strict sense of good and bad and how prioritizing oneself or even acts of self-preservation can be seen as immoral or like an act of the devil. Um, in this piece, I was relying more on um, telling this narrative through um, dream symbolism. And so the, the clock represents uh, time passing um, until like a point of complete disintegration. And the ax represents my willingness and my agency within this decision to um, deny or give up my innocence. Um, and the apple is um, kind of what represents all that is good. It's a, it's a reference to the Garden of Eden. The burnt lace represents um, destruction through like the fire and it results, like all of this kind of culminates and results in these ants that are like crawling up, trying to rise, which kind of symbolizes like the growth that I feel like comes from decay in the natural cycle of life. Um, and then the last piece in my show that I will specifically be talking about is a fiber sculpture called Mystic Garden. And with this piece, I really just wanted to create like a blissful world in which life could thrive like uninhibitedly. Um, I feel like a lot of the work that I've normally done does kind of concern um, heavier and darker themes. And so I wanted to make something that felt more healing and constructive. Um, I was like thinking, I was also thinking about like the relationship between the viewer's thoughts and desires and how um, they're always forcibly projected onto objects. Um, and I was hoping that people would be able to critically engage with themselves alongside the work by observing it and being able to like interact with it in real time. Um, 
by observing like this inherent power dynamic that exists between the object and the viewer. Um, and I was also thinking about um, the intimacy of the process. Um, needle felting, for those of you who don't know, or just any felting process in general takes a very long time. There was a lot of love that was put into this labor. And I feel like conceptually it kind of lends towards my work because it's not necessarily about like legitimizing, but it's about being able to appreciate and see the kind of invisible work. Um, and so here is a static photo of the exhibition um, with the projected GIF. So it was moving, um, there was no sound, but um, I wanted to lay it, lay it out like this so people could come close to the work and really like engage with it and um, kind of immerse themselves in these like little worlds. Um, and then um, I included the shelf um, here because I feel like when placed within the context of my work, these like miniature items that I've collected over the years or have been gifted um, are, are asking us to simultaneously contend with icons of nostalgia and comfort through consumerism, but also inspiring us to see beyond the value judgments that are often placed on cuteness. Um, and there, are some, there were some postcards in the middle um, with a QR code to my website. Um, and so just want to say thank you to everyone who has offered their wisdom, support, and guidance during this time in my life. I'm extremely grateful for all of the wonderful individuals I've met, both like at CCA and outside of CCA, because I could not have done this without your help. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, we can have Amy join the conversation with you now. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Erin. That was a really great presentation. Um, and I wanna start by talking about your installation. Um, I spent a lot of time with the pictures that were in the Google Drive. Um, I didn't get to see your show in person, but I, I'm very glad to see the images. Um, and I didn't realize there, uh, did you say there was, you had projected a, a GIF on the wall? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that so that I can imagine it as I'm looking at your images? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mostly wanted to create like a space that felt um, inviting, but also like trance-like, which is usually the state of mind that I'm in while I work and so I felt like it added an interesting texture onto mm. like all the pieces um uh mm. and so but, it was more of a because I could kind of see this sort of not a swirl but this kind of s-shaped pattern that was mm -hmm. on the black so is that what it was and it was mm -hmm. and was mm -hmm. it a fluid movement or was it more um uh kind of choppy I guess it was fluid um, okay okay yeah I, I like that uh what you said about the trance quality I can envision that in my mind um what I thought was so interesting about your installation was that I immediately felt like you had creating created a living room and mm. that you were inviting me and your audience into this space and when we think about a living room. Um, it is a space where we relax, where we uh, maybe spend time with other people. They tend to be comfortable. There's a cushy couch. There's, uh, you know, you're surrounded by objects that um, you like to look at. And that's what that space felt like to me, is that it was in a living room, which I found very inviting. Um, <clears throat> and so, can you talk can you talk a little bit about that like what your intention was for that space? Mm -hmm. Um I guess I think my work in general does kind of reference the like idea of like domesticity and and comfort but I think at the same time there's also um some baggage like emotional baggage that comes with that so I feel like being able to like kind of just like lay out my work and like 
have it resonate, you know, with people just, just seeing it like plainly for what it is, is very important to me. Um, it was not exactly my intention to make the space look like a living room. I was thinking more of like, like a childhood bedroom mm -hmm. or just like a very like um, personalized space. But mm -hmm. I think that was a really interesting um, like read on mm -hmm. my work. Yeah, and I can see the the bedroom idea as well in a childhood space, especially considering the childlike quality of the imagery that you're choosing to use. Um, and I see, like when I'm looking at your work, I'm seeing a humor and I'm seeing a curiosity um, through this imagery, but also in this combination of an interdisciplinary practice where you're doing, you're trying out different materials formats and techniques and there's a balance between as you said the analog and the digital um, and I find that to be very effective in what you're trying to do um, and I really like that you are I sort of see um, this idea of cuteness and the diminutive um, or a smallness um, <clears throat> and you know for myself as a cis identifying woman, um, especially of my age where I have been told to be small my whole life and that it's important that I'm cute. Um, I like that you are taking those uh, norms and you're kind of flipping them on, on their upside down and reclaiming them as a way to express, um, and I'll use the word subvert too, um, to kind of change the way that we look at these things or look at women um, uh, or anyone really who is outside of, of heteronormative um, that space. Um, you are reclaiming it as your own. You're turning it around and, I, and um, trying to explain your point by that reclamation. It kind of reminds me of uh, the LGBTQIA community taking that pink triangle that was a symbol um, in during the Nazi war and turning that around and claiming that as their own. And I kind of see a parallel there with what you're doing in your work. And I think that's really exciting. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to also talk about a creation of a manifesto. I feel like you need a written manifesto. Um, and if you'd ever considered something like that. And I feel like if you don't have something like that, I think it would be a really great way to reflect on this incredible thing that you just did, completing your BFA and having this amazing show. And to think of back, to reflect on what you've learned and to create a manifesto for yourself moving forward in your practice. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things do you think you might have in a manifesto? I think that's a really good question because I don't know how to answer this succinctly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've definitely thought, I've, I've definitely written some things like, like diary-like manifestos in the past, but I, I would look back on them a couple years later and realized that it no longer resonated with me. So I think there's always this like fear of like permanence and like sticking to my word with me. And so I feel like, and I also feel like I'd just be regurgitating a lot of the texts and what a lot of other wise people have said before me by, so I, I feel like maybe kind of, my manifesto would maybe be more like um, open-ended, I think, than just like a, like a straight up, like almost like guide, rule book kind that of makes thing. sense there's mm -hmm. a, there's something about it being um fluid or mutable you know like this is how it is now and I'm open to it changing later um mm -hmm. I can see that being helpful um I wondered if you know of the work of Nicholas Gallinan no could you please put that in the chat yeah um hold on so he is an indigenous artist. Uh, hold on one sec. Here we go. And I'm not gonna say too much because we don't have a lot of time to get into it and it's about you, but I feel like 
you might enjoy checking out um, his work. And I apologize if I'm getting his pronouns wrong, um, but check him out. He's indigenous um, and he's interdisciplinary. Um, I think you might enjoy him. And I also wondered if you've read the book, do you know about the author Ocean Vuong? I don't think so. So he's a poet um, and a novelist and he has a book uh, that I think you'll really enjoy. It's called On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I'm not gonna say too much because we don't have a ton of time, but I think you would really enjoy it. It's fiction. Well. It's a memoir, but it feels like fiction. And it's um, a kind of a fantastical story about the way their life um, growing up in a very challenging situation in the United States. And they are an incredibly sensitive, um, imaginative human. And I think you might really enjoy that book. And I think because you're creating these imaginative worlds, I feel like fiction is a good place for you to find inspiration. I read a lot of fiction in my own practice um, as part of my research. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, in those stories, I am often finding things that take me to a subject, a nonfiction subject that I can further research and add into my work. And so I feel like fiction might be a really good space for you for inspiration and creating these imaginative, fictive worlds. Um, and another area I think you might be interested in is a subject called, um, uh, it's a like a paratruth. Um, and it's kind of like partial truth and partially made up. Um, mm. And I think you might enjoy that as well. Um, and I wanted to tell you, I spent a little time on your website and um, I found it absolutely delightful. And I know it's a work in progress, but I really felt like it spoke to um, your work and, and what you're trying to put into the world. So keep going with that, it looks great. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome. Coding is hard, but I've been trying. <laughs> yeah, but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really fun and imaginative and I felt like it helped me understand even more about what you're trying to do because I really felt like between the symbols and the way that you had set it up and there was a humor to it um, that I thought was really uh, pointing to who you are um, as a person. Yeah. Um, I wonder like, what are you thinking about next for ne that whatever is coming next? Um, like in terms of a, like a career or life? No, or just or your just work. Like, because oh, okay. I imagine, okay. I mean, every time we make work, you know, we come up with more work while we're making the work. So I wondered if that happened in, during this process of putting together your BFA show. Definitely. I think even before the BFA show, I had a lot of like ideas. I like to do a lot of, um, like trilogy kind of series. Like mm -hmm. I, I have, I have these, um, like colored pencil drawings that I'm, I'm still working on and they kind of deal with like existential themes of like life and death and kind of contemplating that without really coming to like a succinct answer because it's not like you really can um uh and there's there's a lot of projects that I would really like to uh pursue in my own time without you know like strict deadline there's there's a lot more sculpture that I'm interested in and more mixed media work because mm -hmm. I think with all the processes that I've learned in school a lot of them are very um step by step like time consuming and combining many different very time intensive labor intensive processes doesn't always work with deadlines mm -hmm. so again, I feel like a lot of I feel like my work is alive and I feel like I can continue to like um sort of like create like reiterations of my work or just for like just add on and like expand mm -hmm. these things you know like for example like with etching like I could continue to do more layers you know I could make a custom frame for it 
you know, there's there like I feel like the endless, there's endless possibilities. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot okay. of the work that I make is quite labor intensive. And I I like the idea of you finding a response to that that is less laborious, um, kind of working in an opposite way. Um, I think that's a really great idea. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much uh, for the conversation. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, yeah, thank you. It was really nice to meet you. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, up next, we have Ben Chung and Marilyn and I, Marilyn, longtime faculty in the Jewelry Metal Arts Program. We're both going to introduce Ben. Um, Marilyn's going to start off and then I'll continue. What can I say about Ben? <laughs> Ben Jung was born and raised in Los Angeles from first-generation Korean immigrant parents who were involved with the cult society. Ben says it wasn't a reality having the choice of attending college, let alone an art college. My teenage years, as a runaway, I've searched for guidance from anywhere I could find it. The only thing that helped me cope through these tough times of and beyond was the kindness and understanding of an art teacher at my continuation high school. As Robert Lugo says, everything around you changes when you're able to fall, when you have access to an education in the arts, or I'm sorry, when you're able to fail and you have access to an education in the arts. I want to use my art as a beacon, a beacon to attract those in need giving them technical skills and confidence they need to build a foundation on. Extending a hand down, as my art teacher did, as CCA did by acknowledging my art and giving me a full scholarship, passing on the legacy to the next generation. Ben is very self-motivated with excellent project and time management skills. When he has an artistic or te technical goal, he engages deeply with exploration. He found his strengths in CAD digital fabrication for his artwork. His general contracting skills, ceramic and other craft skills allow him to build installations, spaces, and work in any materials that he chooses. Um, he has worked Thank you. for several we ha he has worked for several Bay Area artists and companies during his education here at CCA. Each of these places has gained from his dedication to his work and development of skills and knowledge. In his BFA exhibition, Ben combines his personal stories of tragedy with the aesthetics of a former DJ life and computer technology to create an installation. His digital light experience, which includes archetype symbols, creates a space of wonder and meditation and acts as a memorial for his sister who committed suicide, honoring her and others like her whose lives were shortened, it helps tell the story that even in death, those that support us continue to lift us up and guide us to be our authentic selves. The installation includes kinetic jewelry created in CAD, then cast using traditional casting mat materials and techniques. The movement of his lotus ring in the installation captures his idea of transformation. His goals with this project use trauma as motivation to create work that can initiate collective acknowledgement of emotional stress and promote healing. As a community member in the program, Ben has been instrumental in establishing our 3D printing protocols. We wanted to thank him for testing our equipment and digital fabric our digital fabrication equipment and for finding the best practices for workflow and safety that we will continue to use in our program. Um, ben, you are a lifelong learner whose self-motivation uh, gives you the ability to dive deep within your goals. The challenges you have overcome and accomplished have been uh, uh, the challenges you have overcome, you have and accomplished are impressive. Congratulations, and we look forward to seeing your work and your career progress. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. You're welcome. Uh, 
do do I go now? Yeah, you can go ahead and share uh, your screen and start presenting. Okay. Ben, you're muted. Oh, I think you're still muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. That's Great. weird mutes it when I share it. Oh. That's so weird. It mutes it when I when I share my screen. Wait, let me just that's weird. That didn't happen before. That. No, we tested that out. Mm. Can you keep my screen now? Hey. No, yeah, we're good now. It. Okay, let me just do the the whole screen then. Does that work? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. fine. All right, cool. Uh, so this is me at the senior thesis. Um, you already know about me. So the important thing is my sister died and I got a full ride. And I was uh, Korean society Jehovah's Witness. Um, it's a little different. It's similar to the English society, but the co Korean one is especially smaller. So it felt more like a cult, even though they just say it's a religion. So that's just, uh, I want to use my art to help those who are in pain, empower the meek. I want to give the unheard a voice. I want to show those who are suffering from depression, loneliness, fear, and anxiety or abuse that you're not alone. Um, be a reminder, a beacon that you have the strength inside yourself to get yourself out of that situation if it's making you unhappy and causing you pain. Uh, and also I want to reflect and show other suicide loss survivors. That uh, means like, you know, someone you love who died by suicide. That's called the suicide loss survivor. That's okay and forgive yourself because a lot of them blame themselves for not doing more. Uh, everything I make is dedicated to my sister, Josephine. Uh, she gave everything for me and my younger sister. Um, here, I have, uh, I read a lot. Uh, I think it's, it's, very important. I read a lot of fiction too, or I did before school, uh, but because of school, I kind of missed reading leisurely because I had to do it, you know. So, um, but uh, during school, starting from community college and even before, uh, I got I read these and video. Uh, I saw I got exposed to this media, and it really changed my my life really. And the um, Trauma theory, I, I preach this to everyone I love, too, to my sister, to to my girlfriend. Um, and it's just, it, it tells you how trauma is not a something that could be explained verbally. And the best thing you could do is to just play with clay. And that kind of somehow brings something out. And, and then that's why I changed my... Uh, major from chemical engineering to uh, uh, ceramics in community college, and then I got I got picked up by CCA. Um, and Rivers Manifesto, I, I encourage you to read it. It's it's a poetic to me. Um, it was uh, to my knowledge I, the author was unknown, but in Urban Dictionary they actually say who it is now. Um, but it's very important. And then without wax. Robert Lugo is a teacher at uh, Teller University in ceramics, and he talks about how if, you know, poor, less uh, financially less fortunate people had the access to just a wheel uh, and try to center uh, a clay on a wheel and not be able to do it, um, they would appreciate everything that's made as ceramics uh, and they would go home and they would just look at a simple coffee cup and wonder like how is this made and that that wonder is what sparks uh, children and 
youth and the future to be curious and to find out how everything works and that's how you really learn not by someone trying to drill you memorization and uh this is my first i guess first i worked with metal uh this is the second cnc machine i made i actually made a ceramic 3d printer out of scratch and that's kind of how i got attention from cca arthur saw it at sakaka when i was still at ceramic uh community college and this is just a video of me refining scrap silver uh, someone gave me um, with nitric acid and then purifying refining it and then making it pure i just i was trying to be a chemical engineer so this the kind of stuff interested me um it's just the silver scrap silver sprue that I did right there and then I just filter it I'll fast forward it and then this copper nitrate and then and that's the silver I refined and then this is my JMA one uh, final uh, I think it was this project that made me switch over from ceramics to uh, jewelry in the beginning of this. Um, uh, Marilyn was, I try, I gave, I showed her our first version of this, and then she said something really constructive to me, and I was kind of flabbergasted. I guess is the word is like wow, like. Uh, she really encourages encouraged me to take it further. So um, this is all using simple tools. This is not before I started casting and all that. So this was just using needle, the, the jeweler saw and some files and solder. And this part right here really taught me how to solder because I had to each solder each one individually. And that's pretty hard to do if you're inexperienced. And... Uh, uh, in between this and here, I learned a lot. Um, in between this and here, I worked at a lot of jewelry repair uh, for the summer and then on. So like, I've I've repaired and resized maybe 50 gold rings in between here and here, and like, I didn't retip any, but I did everything else. So I, I my skill went up a lot, but this is what my thesis is about it's a mechanical ring and when you put your finger inside the ring there's a trigger at the bottom that pushes up this uh, straight bearing and these all have round bearings on it and then when this gets pushed down the pedals close and then when, when it gets pushed it up by the finger it opens up and this is the video um, a nice video of that I'm sorry, my internet is not that fast, so maybe we'll skip it. You can see it later. And this is my installation. And then the jewelry is inside there. And then there was rings to take on these, but nobody knew to take them. Only from my friends did, and I gave some away. And this is just a tribute to my sister. It's Lotus, and I'm like kind of just sacrificing everything to her because everything this degree it was for her. I, I would have dropped out numerous times because of COVID and all that, being homeless and all that. But I had friends and family to support me and my somewhat of my you know cleverness to get resources that I needed, and yeah, that's it. Oh, no, it's not gonna work. And that's me. And then that's the tricolor LED mirror thing I made. And that's it. Oh. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. We can invite Amy to join the conversation now. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Um, that was great. That was super interesting. 
I like knowing about your background as a chemical engineer, and now you're getting into um, artwork and to making art. I think that's a really interesting transition, and I imagine that all of the experience you had before, that interest that you had in in being that kind of engineer, is going to inform, has informed your work, and will continue to inform your work. And um, <clears throat> I wanna, uh, I, I did spend some time with your the images from your installation, and so I wanna. I want you to talk me through a little bit about how that space works, because um, I have some ideas of my own, but I'd like you to explain um, what what's going on. And I'm really curious about the materials um, <clears throat> and the, yeah. So let's start with that. Uh, well, the, the style, I guess, I, I started developing because I, I started taking a lot of before this is before school and like around the time my sister was you know being um a little crazy uh so I was being a little crazy on my own and you know going out to parties and clubs and doing party party drugs and stuff um there's a thing that people used to do it started with glow sticks it's a popular culture thing people know about glow sticks is uh they used to like hold glow sticks and they'll wave it at your face um, while you're on drugs and it'll, it'll, your eyes are dilated because of the drugs and then it'll look crazy. But that's like the first generation. What I started was, it was like these little LED flashlights and then you could adjust these little flashlights and then when you dim it, it was actually blinking slower. So when you flash it like this, it would, it would create these little dots in midair. And people would put these in in each finger and mm -hmm. then they would they would do this inside in front of your face uh and this is before the stages were really really crazy now, nowadays the stages are are amazing now so you the little doing little this isn't going to compete with the major stages so it started with this and then i was like my friends were like okay now now draw an elephant in the midair i was like okay how do i do that so what I did was I created images on the plexiglass with laser engravings and I injected light through the side. So yeah. it started off with hand lights and I was like, I want to do stage lights and, and like installation, light, light installations. So that's how it started. Mm -hmm. um, so the hands that are coming up are inspired by what it's you would attribute describe. to that yes okay it, got it yeah because i i see them as having two purposes um because you talk so much about wanting to help others and you're talking about suffering and pain and so i'm seeing them as both like reaching up for help like i need help but it's also like a hand like a helping hand reaching yeah. up so they have this duality happening you know and i feel like it's both things at the same time am, am i right in saying that yes and yeah. if you read read the second article that I, I i read i put up put up it's it's about that culture that manifesto it, i did read it yeah it's about raver it's about those yeah. people like people who all gather it used to be about this but it's not anymore if you go to like the art festivals now it's called it's not called raves anymore but uh back in the day when it was underground it was everyone you knew was about this people went there to feel this love that normally you wouldn't get this unconditional love from strangers you just go and there's like ten thousand people or just it may be drug induced but still this environment that creates love it i think is what saved me and for me i have 11 suicides in my family including my sister and mm. and I think that what saved me was this this environment and knowing that exists. So yeah. I, I wanted to sh I'm, I want to share that that plur. It's called plur. It's 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 really overplayed now. Um, the word plur, but it's peace, love, unity, respect, and responsibility. Um, and you know if someone's using it correctly, if they have the two R's. You the nowadays they only have one R. Uh, uh to make it look cool you know like for yeah. media or whatever but um so you're you're really interested in this um the connection that you were making and then presenting that kind of human connection or creating it through your work yes 
yes yeah. i yes i i i don't party anymore i'm too old now so i don't i'm i'm past all that like i I feel like I was exposed to it for a reason, but I'm not stuck in it like my other friends are sometimes, you know, they're just stuck in that world. Um, and that's what art did also to me that I was stuck in this, like, you know, you party and the only way to fund that partying is to eventually get into some sort of marketing of the, mm -hmm. you know, paraphernalia. So I tried it by doing, I, I sold the lights uh, uh, by, and that's how I kept on partying is I, I became a vendor of the lights yeah. Uh, so, so when uh, I'm, but, when uh, I'm looking at your ins installation now, I'm, you know, before I was envisioning it as being a kind of sanctuary, like it almost felt like it's a, like a kind of church where you have this aisle flanked by these hands. And then that I was so, sort of seeing the um, skeleton figures at the front as, as kind of chairs that I was sort of imagining that I could drape my body over them and that they would be a sort of supportive device for whomever is in the installation. Um, and then you have that sort of focal point of the mirror up above. And so I, I think that the way that you were lighting it, you were presenting a very clear pathway or this passage towards um, something better or something or an alternative to Portal. despair okay Portal, yeah. um and then you have this kind of duality of the hands on either side that i thought was really interesting and you know as you're talking and and, <clears throat> and i'm thinking about uh you know what what kind of movement or area that might be interesting to you um is something called relational aesthetics um and this is more about artists as facilitators versus instead of being a maker and that the art that you create is, it's an exchange between you as the artist and your audience members. And then essentially what you're doing is you're empowering them by you're giving them information or knowledge which is helping them to create um, a means to make a change in the world or in their personal lives. And so you're not, it's not about creating objects, although I think that there are some who part of the, of the installation or the presentation or the performance that they're doing, there are objects involved, but it might be something because you're so interested in helping others through your work, it might be an interesting area for you to um, do a little reading about. And that also makes me think about social practice, um, which I feel kind of goes hand in hand with relational aesthetics. I mean, it does. So um, it's just areas that you might consider as you move forward. Um, and I don't know if you've considered social practice, but it, it might be because you have created an experience in that installation. And so, and that's essentially what a lot of social practice is, is creating experiences where everyone is participating in an event or um, <clears throat> some kind of uh, activity together for an outcome of some kind. Um, and then kind of on the opposite side of that, I, I've been thinking a lot about Dehosa in relationship to your work. Do you know about him? Um, I'll put that name in the chat. Uh, He's really interested in place and he creates these um, spaces where he, he makes um, structures out of transparent fabric. So he'll create an entire architectural environment that a person, the viewer can walk in and around and through, but you can see through all of it and they're, they're colorful. And I feel like you might, he might speak to you just con thinking about the architecture of your own project and the creating the space. Um, he does that in his own work. Um, have you heard of him? Did, where did he go? Well, I think we lost Ben. He may have oh, had no. a bad connection. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. If he comes back, See if he comes back, yeah. Look, sorry, uh, my Wi-Fi goes out every time the Bart goes by for some. 
we're getting so close. We're almost done. So, <laughs> <laughs> have, but I was asking, like, have you have you heard of Dehosa? Do you know? No, about him? no. Yeah, check him out. I think you okay. might. You might. I mean, it's. I think you might enjoy um, learning about him. Um, and as someone who's, I've dealt with a lot of grief in my own life, um, and I have one of my closest friends um, died of suicide. Um, gosh, 25 years ago. And, um, it's kind of, uh, it's hard to not be touched by that, I think. Um, but I, when I was in graduate school, my father passed away. He'd passed away just before I started school. And one of my professors recommended that I read a book by Joan Didion called the year of magical thinking. Um, and it's about her husband and he had a heart attack and died in front of her. Um, so it's a different relationship. But the things that she says about grief and loss are really incredible. And this idea of magical thinking, and I kind of feel like some of the things that I'm seeing in that in, in your installation are sort of this kind of magical, fantastic kind of space. And, and you might, that book might resonate with you. It's a beautiful book. Um, yeah. And I'd love to offer you more books on grief, but I actually, I haven't, when I was looking back over my work, I made a lot of work about grief uh, in my first semester of graduate school, but I didn't read a lot. I read that book and I read a book uh, by Sigmund Freud that was about trauma. Um, <clears throat> and maybe you have read that essay as well. I have a little bit, but I haven't read it all. Yeah, <laughs> no, I haven't two. read it all either. Yeah, two. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely like you I think reading parts of it um and and in small bites is the best way to approach him um but I found that to be really helpful too so I hope that you take some time just like I said to Aaron to really reflect on what you just accomplished because it's really incredible um and you have faced some really incredible things in your life so far and taking some time to honor what you have done and, you know, spending a little time thinking about it and writing about it. I highly recommend this. It's a big part of my process. When I finish a body of work is I, I like to take time to sit with my work um, and just be with it. And then I'll start to write about it. And uh, I go back and forth and, and it, it can take, you know, it can take some time to do it, but I think it's a really nice way to honor what you've done and all these incredible objects that you've created and the experience that you've had. I think it can be really worthwhile. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Thank you both so much. Congratulations. Um, if Kathy could join us to introduce Eugen, that would be fantastic. Kathy is our um, faculty from ceramics and um, she's going to introduce our next presenter. <clears throat> yes, thank you. I'm so excited. Um, all right. Eugen Han is a transcultural artist with roots in Korea, Guatemala, and for the last several years, lucky for us, here in the Bay Area. Her experiences living across these different languages, cultures, and communities has made her deeply interested in issues of belonging. Her colorful ceramic sculptures and immersive installations reference these personal experiences while also acting as, in her words, a physical diary that allows people to relate to her and unpack the often uncomfortable experiences of belonging. Um, I first met Eugen when she was a student in my beginning ceramics class in 2019, um, so long ago. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be able to witness her growth as an artist. Um, her work is not only beautiful, but also incredibly humorous. Um, I still remember her first project in which she was inspired um, by Dr. Pimple Popper and created a face covered with pimples that morphed into delicate flowers. Um, Eugen is not only a dedicated and talented artist, but she is also very supportive and kind to those around her. Um, I believe so much in her artistry and skill that I actually hired her to help me fabricate my own sculptures. I'm so excited for the art she's making now, as well as the art she will make in the future. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing your presentation, Eugen. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be sharing my screen now. <laughs> okay. 
So thank you again, Kathy, for the introduction. Um, so I'll introduce my name again. I'm Eugene Han. I'm a ceramic artist. And I want to start with um, some artists that I've been inspired to make the works that the recent work that I've made. I'm starting with Alexandra Kehayog. Hello, I will be pronouncing her last name really badly, but um, she is a textile artist. She does a lot of tufting um, with a, a tufting gun. Um, she Her work includes like memories of very, various native landscapes that she has visited and she desires to preserve over time. Um, I definitely have got inspiration from her landscapes. I've even kind of mimicked some of them in my work. Um, they are very grandiose. They're huge. Um, and I love the aspect that she um, welcomes people to interact with her work, which I am very interested to. Um, the next one is Angela Oloshop. She was actually um, a CCA student here. She graduated in CCA. I think she was, um, she graduated as a painter, um, um, but her work often, um, often experiments with painterly glazes to experience, um, to express feelings of transcendental experiences through form and color. And finally would be Anabel Juarez. Um, I think she's a Mexican uh, ceramic artist. She does a lot of um, her like recurring theme in her work for um, uh, notions of femininity, uh, resilience and desire and memory. Um, her flowers are massive, which um, later on you can see that I did uh, pick on the way she builds her flowers. And I um, kept putting different, like my aesthetic to it, but she definitely was a big inspiration to, for me to keep working on my work. Um, so I want to start with my first sculpture work, which is called Quinceanera. Um, like Kathy said, I was raised in Guatemala um, and I could not uh, have the celebrity, um, the parties that my Guatemalan friends used to have. Um, I am Korean, but I associated a lot with my Guatemalan friends because they were my only friends growing up. So this was kind of like the dress that I, like a quinceanera dress kind of, um, that I wish to have worn on my 15th birthday. Um, a lot of my first work kind of talks about like my ethnicity and my identity. So like the second work is like called Take Your Shoes Off. Um, pretty much you will know which Asian house, like which house an Asian house when you see like your shoes outside. And that's how I knew where my friends were. Um, we live in a small like, um, um, uh, like a colony, I want to say. I don't know. It's like a little, it's like a house kind of like put together and we'll just go around and then that's how I know where to find my friends. And it's kind of, it was kind of like that. Like only way I could find my friends were um, in front of a door were like shoes like everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. And my next one was about like, the rules of how to eat food, which I think food was um, um, was a very um, influential thing to me growing up, and um, it's like an outdated thing. Obviously, we don't do these rules anymore. But I feel like 
um, it's such a proper thing to do in a dinner in a dinner table. So I kind of wanted to not do that. So like that was like kind of my um, like a menu of like a rules and then just food just splattered because I didn't want to do them. And um, the popping flowers is the um, the ceramic that I did with Kathy, um, her class was called Ugly Beautiful. And it was about, um, I wanted to talk about something ugly I felt um, my whole life, which was pimples in my face. And I wanted to make them beautiful. So I wanted to make it out of flowers. Just mm -hmm. like if I pop flowers in my face, they wouldn't, they wouldn't feel ugly or disgusting. <laughs> so um yeah and yeah, it's just after my ethnicity or identity I kind of kept going with um, more personal stuff as like pimples to now like um like a relationship that happened and it didn't end so like I made polaroids um and decal and just like you put it in a shoebox and kind of forget about it and and the decals, I did not plan the decals to kind of look uh, old and kind of fade out, but it worked out really well, <laughs> um, which I love about ceramics. <laughs> you don't know what you get after you fire it. <laughs> um, my next one is about, uh, they're called shields because they are inspired by the Atlantic shooting um, that happened when Asian hate crime was very active in 2020, um, 2021, 20, um, um, there were pretty much hands. I was thinking about my community and how I could like protect them. And the first thing I thought were like hands kind of protecting a small animal. So I kind of made different forms of hands like a in abstracted form. Um, and I wanted to make like a huge monument monument out of it. Like, of course I can't do it out of, well, like it's not impossible but to make it out of ceramics, but it's just the thought. I just wanted to protect my community in a way, just to make like a huge monument for people to be sheltered. But obviously it's not only for my community, but anyone that needs shelter. So, um, that thought inspired me to make hands um, to protect someone. And as time went by, I really loved that form, a uh, uh, blobby abstracted form that I kind of went to wanting to do what I really love, which was flowers. And um, I was having a hard time um, last semester and I just wanted to put that outside like um like an open diary a physical diary which I could physically see and maybe people can see and kind of relate which was um self-sabotaging myself I felt overthinking and everything was very um harmful for me especially as an artist and I wanted to convey that and I want to make this work kind of like a delicate flower like cute flowers, but they're piercing themselves, you know, because that's how I felt. Like I, like, I was the one hurting myself. And I kind of wanted to go bigger, which on this ranch allowed me to do that. Um, I went to a residency and I had the great experience to be with um, Yuna Paisola, um, great artist. Um, which we did totems and I really enjoyed making all these flowers, which they all broke because I only had a week to build them and a week to fire them. But I tried my best to um, glue them and cover them, which uh, it's not new in ceramic. You will always uh, experience something like this. And I think the greatest thing to learn from my ceramics is how to overcome this hardship of breakage and 
and something you would not expect what the kiln would do to your work. And that will come to the installation that I did, which um, you can see um, the picture was taken by Ashley Malloy. She's a student here. Um, I wanted to make a space that was comfortable but uncomfortable at the same time. I painted the walls yellow and to for people to to make it have a very welcoming feeling, inviting feeling, but as they enter the space and look at it, they'll feel uncomfortable of how bright and neon it was. But as you would um, sit or lay on the grass or um, carpet, uh, you kind of find trash around or even hair and the ceramic flower will make it kind of difficult for you to kind of sit on them. So uh, if that's what I wanted to do, kind of have that, because that's how I felt in the pandemic. Um, my, I am a very homebody person and being at home was my safe space, but being here and um, doing everything here just felt uncomfortable now. So that's what I want to um, put outside for people to maybe relate and to see. So just that'll be it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eugene. Um, Amy, if you can join the conversation, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. That was really great. Um, exciting to hear you talk about your work. Um, <clears throat> um, as with the other two students, I want to talk about your installation. I spent time with your images as well, and um, I I found that your uh, the yellow that you chose was a really effective color um, <clears throat> because I think yellow at first it seems like it's a an inviting color. It's warm. It's friendly. It seems happy or joyful, but. Um, the tone that you chose of the yellow, I feel like um, it, and I and I have actually used yellow in my own work. And so I immediately saw this in yours. I was using it with a piece that I made was about anxiety and at being agitated. And I felt like the tone of the yellow you chose was really effective for creating that space of these two things, these two very opposite things happening where you're welcoming us in, but you're also making us uncomfortable. And so I thought that was really well done. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, because uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming it's a mixture of ceramic and then the green pieces. Can you tell me a little bit more about them because they appear to be textiles? Is that yes. right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so they're tufted rugs. Um, I, um, I just did them pretty much last minute. I, um, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't think they would take that long because mm -hmm. this is like a new medium for me, and I wanted to incorporate uh, something soft, not only just clay, and uh, yeah, which was very hard to actually um, do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, That's but yeah. that you took a risk um, I, I, <laughs> and I think um, taking risks is super important um, and so congratulations on doing that and I again I felt like that was an effective form as well and I I'm interested in that mixture of the hard and the soft and the ceramic pieces have a softness to them. Um, and, you know, not just, not only through their shape or their form um, and the texture of them, but also the color, but there's something a, a little menacing 
about them. And I feel that way about the tufted rugs as well. Um, it's again, it's just like it welcomes you in, but there is something else going on. And so I know you were wanting people to feel uncomfortable in that space. And I don't know what the reactions were, but from looking at that work and hearing you talk about it, it, it feels like, or it seems like that came across. Um, and so well, very well done on that. Um, and it, it started to make me think about um, the sublime. Do you know what the sublime is? Yeah, like I feel like that that was one of the my biggest reaction to what to your work was this uh, interest in the sublime or that you were kind of pointing in that direction. Um <clears throat> and I was I, I'm glad that you know about it because I feel like that's something that would be fun to dig into where you know you're looking at this incredible natural environment, mm -hmm. but it is so menacing. It's you know, it's this yeah. kind of awestruck by this thing that is ultimately can be very dangerous in addition to being incredibly beautiful. And <clears throat> I think that uh, that's an interesting space uh, for any artist is to be able to create tension in work by bringing opposites together. It's something that I love to do in my own work. And I I'm curious about what happens when you bring opposites together, um, when they are equal to one another, what happens? Mm -hmm. What's the feeling like? What does it look like? What does it do to your viewer? Um, I think that it's a great way to create an immersive environment is by bringing opposites together. Um, and they have to be equal to one another. Um, one cannot have more weight than the other, which is a very, very challenging thing to do, but definitely something um, to strive for. What do you think about that? This idea of opposites coming together in a, in a singular, in one piece. I love it. Um, I've, I think you started with Kathy's class, like the ugly beautiful like that duality i love anything to do with that um also arthur's class um i think um i've learned a lot from that one class that we talked about duality and i love that concept of putting opposites in together and working um putting them and then working and having them work together mm -hmm. i think it's like something i want to continue doing for sure Mm -hmm. or like start um, exploring more of that too. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting space and a great challenge. Like what are the formal devices I'm going to use? What are the concepts I'm going to pair so that I can create that liminal space? Um, and, and, and how is it, how is my audience going to react to that? I'm very curious about that. Um, <clears throat> I want to recommend a book called Vibrant Matter. Um, I read this just this past year, and it's about objects um, that are not living, having agency of their own, um, <clears throat> and how stat things that are static um, have a life. and uh, what what is that life like and how does that uh, how is that object interacting or what is its place in the world even though it is a static object and I feel like what I'm seeing in your work you might benefit from the, it's a philosophy of the vibrant matter um, it's written by Jane Bennett um, and you might really enjoy it and she gets into some political things she gets into some aspects of the patriarchy she gets into um, <clears throat> some uh, religious, so it's it covers lots of ground. She talks a lot about nature and that might be the most appealing aspect to you. Um, but I think, I think it might be a good book for you to check out. And I'm also thinking a lot about this painter. Well, he's, he's an interdisciplinary artist. His name is Frank Walter. 
he passed away a number of years ago. He's from Antigua. Um, <clears throat> and his work, he uses geometry in his work. Um, it feels a bit like outsider art. He does a lot with place and landscape, but there's an abstract quality to it. And the, his colors, I, you might find him really interesting um, to check out. I, and he's someone that I discovered this year and I really, really love his work. There was a, an exhibition of his work back in June in New York. I can't remember the gallery, um, but I could look it up and I could send it to Kathy or Curtis or Marilyn and get it to you. Um, uh, how are we doing on time? Are we good? Yeah, we can we can wrap okay. it up there or we can. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> good. Thank you, thank you. Um, congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. yeah, thank you both. Thank you for the discussion. Congratulations, everybody. Um, to, to wrap up, I'd just like to say a few closing remarks. Um, so I'm so I'm so proud of all of you. You you all did such a great job with your presentations and your BFA exhibitions. And um, I just have a statement I want to read to you. So um, the the challenge the challenges that you've gone through have been immense. And undergrad education is a challenging uh, is challenging at any time, but you've completed your education in a world that has really changed forever. Our eyes are now open to how quickly normal can shift to surreal and how multiple unimaginable things have become a reality. It started back, feels like ages ago when the Bay Area had fires and we had to evacuate the Oakland campus. And I remember thinking, you know, how scary it was and how unfamiliar that was when we, I think we were there together that day, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, you know, I think we were also there together. We said, <laughs> bye, see ya, see ya soon. And that was a year later. Um, you know, we went through a hundred year pandemic. We've gone through or we're going through social reckoning. Um, we are, we've been through online learning and hybrid learning and leaving the beloved o Oakland campus and unifying here in San Francisco. You guys have the privilege of being one of the first um, graduating classes of the San Francisco campus in the uni unified structure. You have all been through so much. Um, you know, this isn't even mentioned. Each of you have had really personal things that you've gone through um, that have been heroic to really to really go through. Uh, reaching your goals are about navigating desires and motivation and sacrifice and compromise and learning from your experiences. You have all practiced this over and over and over again during your time here and during the last several years. These challenges have allowed you to gain new skills and a kind of nimbleness and resilience that really no other generation um, has because they haven't gone through as much as you have. You will be able to move through stumbling blocks as you have proven with your work and your dedication that you can channel your feelings of anxiety or uncertainty into works of art that can help you and us rethink. Sorry. Uh, you and us rethink uh, and understand emotions and build productive conversations through your artwork. Another essential part of working towards your goals is community. And building community is what you've done while you've been at CCA. The peers you have gained and the support of faculty and staff and the institution uh, are support systems that you can you can really count on and connect with forever. You know, use each other. You have this great group of seniors that you work with for um, for the last year, and many other colleagues that you work with as students. The last many years that you can lean on, invite each other to exhibitions, um, talk to each other, build critique groups, um, really stay in communication. You are part of the CCA community forever. Yeah, really support each other. Um, know that. You are part of my community forever. You know, some of you have only worked with this semester, but I feel still feel like you are really one of my students. And please use me for a resource um, for you know as long as I'm around. You can really count on myself and the staff and the faculty 
Marilyn and others in our program and all the other programs that you've worked with to help you through the next stages of your career. So um, I'm just looking forward to seeing all your accomplishments and your successes and um, look forward to seeing your careers progress. So congratulations, everybody. <laughs>